want to uh, take a few moments and uh, welcome everybody to our golf course walkabout. Uh, this is our 12.30 session, uh, slightly delayed due to weather. Uh, it's about 12.50 now. Um, but uh, my name is Justin Lawson. I'm lucky to be the general manager here at Brookline Golf Course. I'd like to just take a moment and recognize a few folks that are in attendance. We have uh, Ms. Lee Jackson, she's the Director of Recreation. We have several commissioners from the Park and Recreation Commission, Ms. Clara Belcher, Ms. Teresa Mooney, and uh, Ms. Antonia Bellalta. Um, today's event is uh, a really uh, an amazing and an op wonderful opportunity to take a first step and figure out what's the future for the golf course here at Brookline. Uh, we have retained uh, the services of Mark Mungem, a golf course architect, as well as Mr. Tim Garish, golf course architect and landscape architect. And we're excited that you're here to join us for an amazing walkabout on the golf course. Um, I wish it was blue skies, 75 degrees, and we were giving out sunscreen, but it is the middle of December in, in New England, and we're just grateful that we have such a great turnout. If you haven't had a chance to go downstairs and enjoy a few small bites or a little something that um, quench your thirst, feel free to please do so. The tour today is uh, really going to be about probably about an hour and 45 minutes out on the golf course. So if you do have an umbrella or uh, a raincoat, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, the forecast does look better than this morning, <laughs> and the radar does appear that way too. But I want to turn it over to Mark and, and allow him to introduce himself and just thank you again for coming out and supporting us. And this is an opportunity for you to speak up, ask questions, provide any ideas uh, in, in relationship to the golf course that you may have. So without further ado, Mr. Mark Mungel. Thank you, Justin. Uh, thank you all for coming out today on this glorious day. Um, my name is Mark Mungem. I am a golf course architect. Uh, with me is Tim Garish, who is a registered landscape architect. And uh, myself, I, uh, I got into the business of golf course design. I was in school studying civil engineering at WPI. Uh, decided that you know, I didn't really want to design wastewater treatment plants for the rest of my life because I was working on a nine hole golf course, taking care of it. And um, so I wrote golf course architects to see if there was a job in design. And Mr. Cornish, Jeffrey Cornish, who's a local architect, uh, a renowned architect, he wrote me back and said, you know, with your civil engineering degree, maybe you should get into golf course construction. So then I wrote some contractors and I actually did get a job in golf course construction. I worked for uh, four years building golf courses from northern New York to Florida. Um, in the process, I actually did a job for Jeff Cornish on Cape Cod uh, and Brian Silver, at the, who was his partner at the time. And about a year and a half after that, after doing that job for them, uh, I was in Florida and they called me up and said, hey, would you like to come to work for us? And I said, you bet. I'm ready to leave Florida, go back to New England, where I grew up. And, uh, and so I started working in golf course design. And that, I mean, I've had a great career in it. Uh, I really enjoy what I do. And, uh, and it's great to be here at Brookline. Um, I know the golf course from years back uh, at, when it was Putterham Meadows. And um, it's a, a great facility. It, and it's a great opportunity for us to be able to, to work with you guys to hopefully improve the golf course and, uh, and bring it into the future. Um, it has its, has its issues. As you all know, uh, drainage being the number one issue out on the golf course. And uh, that is something that uh, we're going to be hopefully working on and, and improving. I mean, that's why we're here, is to, is to improve that issue. But also realize that. The golf course has changed over time. It's not, it, it's, uh, a golf course is a living organism. It doesn't stay, uh, stay the same. Uh, there's been bunkers added, bunkers removed. There's been the grass lines change. Um, there's been holes that have been added. The fifth hole is a brand new hole. Well, not a brand new hole, but the fifth hole is a new hole. The 14th green is, has been changed. And so we want to take a look at these changes and make this a cohesive, uh, a cohesive golf course that honors the, the traditional facility that was built originally and designed by uh, Stiles and Van Cleek. Um, a little bit about your design. Wayne Stiles um, is a local architect. He actually 
was a member at Brayburn, grew up in this area, um, lived, in, uh, lived across the street from, or behind the seventh tee at Wellesley Country Club in uh, Needham, um, and designed a lot of really, really good golf courses in this area. Uh, Thorny Lee in Brockton is a Styles course. South Shore Country Club is a Styles course. Needham Golf Club. Um, did a lot of, a lot of, a lot of really good, good designs around here. He competed against Donald Ross. Donald Ross is a you know, much more well-known golf architect than, uh, than Styles was, but they really competed against each other in this area. And you know, in my opinion, many of Styles' courses are just as good as the Ross courses. He just didn't get the publicity that Ross did. So, uh, so Tim Gerrish, uh, I've worked with Tim for, for a lot of years now, Tim. But, yep, 20 years. Uh, Tim, um, Tim grew up in Maine. He uh, went to, well, why don't you tell about yourself? Yeah, 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 no, thank you, I'm here. Uh, yeah, I grew up uh, actually playing Wayne Styles courses and didn't know it at the time, uh, like Wilson Lake and Wabanock up in Maine. And it's what kind of taught me, it's like, oh, there's a difference between mom and pop operations and what architecture is. Uh, I went to graduate school at the University of Massachusetts for landscape architecture, where I met Mr. Cornish. I actually met Mrs. Cornish first, uh, which was the key. And uh, start, I think I was maybe his last associate, I always say. Um, and then I had the opportunity to, to join in with, with Mark at the office in Uxbridge, uh, which was a blast. I had a lot, worked on a lot of great projects. Um, so that's my, that's my input. All right. So uh, today, uh, you know, we've kind of set up a little bit of a tour to go look at some of the issues that are out there and uh, some of what we feel might be opportunities to, to improve upon, uh, upon the golf course as it is now. Uh, I mean, there's, it, there's a lot involved here. I mean, it's not a simple project. Uh, there's uh, wetlands, there's woodlands, there's uh, soil conditions here that are very unique. Um, there's either rock or peat, it seems like, and that's about it. So, um, you know, as I said, drainage is, is, a, is a big part of it, but we also want to look at how the golf course plays, how it can, uh, how the playability can be improved, how it can be a, a course that's uh, um, more fair to all players of all caliber and all levels of play, uh, where, and we, where we can improve safety issues where they may uh, maybe uh, not so good, and um, you know circulation of the golf course. So let's go uh, go out and talk about it a little bit. So, and feel free, you. folks. This is meant to be a collaboration. This process is a collaboration with the community. So at any of these stops, feel free to just to raise your hand, speak up, and uh, introduce yourself, and uh, take the take the time and opportunity to provide feedback or ask a question. Okay? Exactly. Hi, um, excuse me, my name is Maureen Sweeney, I'm on the Lady Fleet. Okay. I just was curious what the general time frame was that you guys are looking at. Um, we're looking at this as a two-phase master plan, where the initial phase is, these, uh, is some of the work that needs to be done in preparation before the U.S. Open uh, make, takes use of the golf course for, for the tournament over at the Country Club. Uh, from that, process, uh, the, there's going to have to be some restoration done after they finish up and we're going to hopefully use that as an opportunity to maybe make some immediate changes to the golf course, some improvements to the golf course. But then the, 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 the other second phase is the completion of the master plan and the implementation of that master plan. Uh, typically these master plans take about a year to create. Uh, like. Justin just said, it's a collaboration. We're not just out here to, to draw something up and hand it over to you and say, this is what we think you should do. Um, there's gonna be a lot of collaboration, a lot of back and forth. Um, and like I said, that process typically takes about a year. So at that point, there'll be a finished master plan that will be presented to the town of Brookline. And then I, I'm thinking that it might be a five year process of implementation. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, we're looking at six years, basically. I have a question. How willing is the town to? So, to give you some context, so the golf course operates on an enterprise fund. 
So we are basically self-sufficient. So we, we don't have that opportunity to go out and collect tax dollars or rely on tax revenue to, to implement some of these projects. We do have the ability to go out and get bonds or apply for grants and that sort of stuff. So part of the complexity is not just the site, but also the financial resource model that we're going to employ uh, to be able to facilitate some of these improvements. So are we talking nature improvements? Nature, yes. Band-aids, basically. No, we want to get down to the crux of the problems and address them appropriately. Yeah. Uh, Bob Schramm, uh, I'm on the Great Space Alliance, a time meeting member here. Uh, Wonderful. But, uh, and, and love your go for uh, Can't wait to see what happens. Follow up question. Uh, you must be, you have sort of a ballpark estimate of how much each of us is we're able to spend on this project over five years or however long it takes. We have some preliminary ideas, but again, you know, there's there's opportunities that we feel that we may be able to qualify for some grant funding, and what those grants, uh, you know, how do those materialize, and the qualifications that are appropriated, and in the awarding of those grants, um, really is going to dictate the total number that we can spend on the project. Um, like like Mark mentioned, it's it's really kind of a two-phase master plan. It's take the opportunity that the U.S. Open's presenting to us, take that this time to really dive into the complexities of this piece of property. If there's some serious complexities with soil structure, uh, stormwater management, the existing drainage systems that are out here, all that really needs to be analyzed for you know, impacts to the environment. We can't just go and propose changes. We gotta figure out what can be permitted, what can't be permitted and all those things take time and to kind of figure out what, what's feasible, what's not, and then what can we afford to do and how do we you know, sequence the, the, the improvements so that we aren't just doing band-aids, we're really making some long-term improvements. From our perspective, just to follow up on that, we don't enter a project saying, well, they only have this much money to spend, so that's what the master plan needs to be for. The master plan, we feel, should be all-inclusive. It should include anything that really should be done to improve the facility. And then you set priorities on the different parts of that master plan. And you take the higher priority items and you do those ones first, obviously. And if you don't reach the goal of doing everything because you don't have the money, then you don't. But, but at least you have a plan in mind as to how to fulfill what's needed on the facility. So in fact, when we do a master plan, the first phase or the first the preliminary part of the plan we don't include any costs because we don't want costs to determine whether you should include that as part of the final plan or not then as we get further into the plan then we start to include costs but but i've seen too often happen where you know a green needed to be rebuilt so you put on the plan to rebuild a green and then they find out it's going to cost $75,000 and they say, oh, no, 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 we can't, we can't spend that kind of money and they don't include it. And then three years later, they're rebuilding the green because it absolutely had to get done. So I don't want to have cost keep you from including something that should be included. Leah. Just to add to Bob Power, we do have some bond power um, yes. right now for phase one. Yeah, we, and, we, and we've identified some resources that, you know, based on current revenues and, and we have some existing bonds that are outstanding that we, we can tap into. Uh, so we have a kind of a preliminary idea. Uh, but again, that, that source of grant that, that could be out there based on the, the environmental uh, constraints of the property and, and, and that sort of stuff really is going to be kind of that exponential factor that really could take this and, and, and allow us to do some really big things out here. And one more point, um, I just want to introduce that we are recording today, so if we can, the questions are already here through the mass, and I need to repeat them, just to just loudly since you're here tonight. Yep. Uh, I, first, I like the, the way you described Charles Osborne, uh, was my resident. Uh, I like the way you described the master plan process and not starting out to curtail it and looking at you know what is possible and, and, and you know the, that discovery you know approach. Um, I'm just wondering, since part of this is revenue based, you know, do you feel like there is 
some area of great potential here that you are, you know, that, that you're going to explore, even though it's very, even though you're in a very preliminary phase? No, Mark, you want to answer that one? So, so uh, Mr. Osborne, if I got the last name correct, uh, asked about is there, are there opportunities in, in a preliminary phase that can help us uh, with the revenue um, and, and opportunities in, in this early part of the master plan that we could enact, correct, that could yeah. have an I'm impact? Not, I, but I'm saying just in general, uh, when approaching this master plan, do you feel there are some areas of great future potential? Um, certainly in doing the master plan, our goal is for the facility to be able to increase revenue. I mean, that's certainly uh, where we, where we want to go with this. Uh, sustainability is, is, is everything in regards to it. Um, it's it's uh, generating enough funds, generating enough money to, imp to be able to improve the maintenance and that then in turn allows you to uh, potentially charge non-residents a higher fee or something like that. I mean, we haven't, we're so early in this that I really don't know if there's something in particular that we can do. Um, one of the big things that uh, we've, we talked about on the last tour and we will again on this one is like uh, right now their tea times are 12 minutes apart because of the first hole and some of the difficulties of the first hole and in, in, uh, in shortening up the space between the uh, tee times. So I mean that would be something in particular that we want to look at to try to increase revenue is to be able to get more players on the golf course. But if there's a not enough, but there's not a change in mind. I think you, your big revenue producer was the driving range or the practice range. I think that was a big deal to change the golf course to add that and that that was huge to what you can generate for revenue there's not going to be something else similar to that uh, most of the course is built on an ancient peak bog that's 60 correct. feet deep and, and that has defeated the best way plans in the past uh, correct so as you go around will you talk about that i will yep any other questions before we get uh, move everything outside and, and begin doing some exercises? Uh, there'll be period periodic stops uh, that Mark will, will conduct, and we'd like to just take it outside and, and enjoy the window that we have of good weather. Um, and then if there's other questions that you don't get a chance to ask, feel free to shoot me an email, and we can facilitate it uh, over to uh, Mark and his team, okay? Excellent. Thank you. I want to stop here just to um, talk a little bit about circulation and how the course has changed uh, since it was first built. Um, when it was initially designed, the re nines were the opposite of what they are now. So they were reversed at some point where the, the, this was the 18th green and that was the ninth green according to the styles design. The first tee were, and the first hole was a par three that played basically the length of the range. And the second, wait a second, is that right? Yeah, the second hole was a dog leg left that played out to the current first green. So uh, the course, the nines have been reversed. And of course the practice range was created and that eliminated the first hole. And the first hole was replaced by a new hole at number five. So the par three fifth hole is a completely, is a, is a new hole to the routing. Um, the goal in golf course design is to have returning nines, is to have the first, the tenth tees, and the ninth and eighteenth greens come back to the clubhouse. That way you can have nine hole rounds, and it allows players to come back, obviously, to have a snack or go to the bathroom at the clubhouse before they continue for the second nine holes. And, you know, it's the best revenue producing uh, circulation. Um, a real negative to your facility quite honestly is the distance that you have to go from the clubhouse to the first tee. At a resort it's not as big a deal. P people are in carts most of the time and they just drive their cart out to the to the first tee and they go from there but I mean Brookline is a walking course. Uh, 
you know, some people take carts, but it's still a lot of walkers. And so to get from one to the, to the first tee is a, is a long haul. Um, the pub pro shop can't see you when you leave here and go to the first tee, so you lose control. And it's just, it's a, I think it's a negative aspect of the, of the layout right now. So that's something that, you know, the range is here to stay. It's, it's a great revenue producer and it's great for your course to have a range when so many public courses cannot. So uh, that's staying. So we have, to, we have to just work around that and figure out how we can best do so. So, so one, of the, uh, one of your objectives to reroute, the, put the first tee closer to the clubhouse? Yes, that would be something we would want to look at. Mm -hmm. And just a general reminder, if everybody can just speak up because we're outside, we do have some more voice, you know, interference with some other noises. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to change nine and 18. That's, they're, they're, those greens are up here near the clubhouse and they're, they're great greens and certainly don't want to change them. The 10th tee is fine, but yes, we'd love to get, we'd love to have a first hole that's, the tee is closer to the clubhouse somehow. Um, I um, imagine you've tried to discover why they changed it. I mean, do you have any inkling? You said you don't know why they did it, but do you have any inkling of why it might have changed? Can you repeat the question, please? I'm, I'm just yeah. want, trying to yeah. figure out why they changed the hold, the direction of the, the holes. I mean, some of the history says that for the first hole, that was the first thing that was done, was the first hole was eliminated and a new hole was added at number five. And I think that change was to increase the par of the golf course, because then they could also make the sixth hole longer, turn it into a par five, and, and it just opened things up a little bit more. Uh, the, the, um, the second hole, the tee was moved back at that same time and lengthened that hole. So I think it was a, a lengthening of the course change when that was first done. But then the second change obviously was to create the range, uh, which was a, is a beneficial addition to the, to the course. I just want to stop here for a second to talk about drainage because that is such a big part of what we're looking at. Um, this stream here that's behind us or next to us uh, goes into a culvert that runs underneath the practice range and pops out again on uh, the left side of the first hole, the current first hole. It's a culvert that was put in, I believe, when the golf course was built and it really it kind of restricts the drainage uh, and determines what we can do here on this side of the golf course. Um, because the invert of that pipe really controls the water leaving, leaving all of this part of the golf course over here. Uh, and that's gonna be our defining factor in how we can drain or what we can do to drain the golf course. And I, I sh or to improve the drainage on the golf course. Not, it's not going to get drained, but so. Where does it empty? It empties out on the left side of the first hole. And where does it go from there? So it, from it goes there, through it, a, a, a myriad of, of wetlands and ends up actually behind the Chestnut Hill Mall. And it, is the issue that it's too small or what's the? It's the elevation. No, it's elevation. The elevation of this pipe controls what can leave, basically. You would preferably like it lower, is that it? We're not going to be able to lower it, but it, but it really kind of, it, uh, it impacts how much slope you can get to this point, basically. Maybe a far-fetched idea, but is it conceivable to create a pond? It's, it's something that we will look at. It's not, you know, we're, we're not sure yet, but it's conceivable to create a pond, yes. I just have a question about, about drainage. One of them was just the one that you mentioned in what sense this is a controlling factor. Um, and uh, I'm just, just wondering that if you look at something here, what are the sort of obvious alternatives that is it possible to provide drainage that, 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 that takes the water f from, the, from, the, uh, from the fairways into this channel? Is it possible to raise elevations? I mean, what are the tools that you have for, 
for these sorts of uh, both problems. of those things. That's the combination of tools that we feel that we have. Uh, you know, we had a couple of others. Well, <laughs> there really aren't those. That's really it. There's it. There's adding adding pipes or drainage within the fairways to better move the water away from them. Um, there's maybe uh, adding more sand into the, the, the soil to be able to move, move the water through sand as opposed to it going into the, the peat. And then there's, there's elevating, elevating to try to get better slope. So, I mean, those are, those are the avenues that we have. Uh, I mean, there's, there's maybe one other slight avenue, and this is the most logical one, and that is, you know, trying to clean out some of the ditches and lower the grade of the bottoms of those ditches so that they better move the water. Because if we can, if you can get the water a little deeper in the ditches, it makes the water move from the fairways a little bit better. So, I mean, those are kind of our avenues that we have to work with. Is that on a great opportunity during the big dig? <laughs> so, just a quick question. So in regard to what you just said, they did uh, improve the ditches. Yes. What was it, 10 years ago? Eight years ago, so nine years, years ago, ago, yep. So what do you do if you go that route and have it be sus sustainable? sustainable? Correct. I mean, with all the work they did, it's a shame that, because there was an improvement. Exactly. We, right. There really was an improvement. It was an improvement after for they, several years, right. and then it, it... Back to normal. Back to what it was. And that's the way nature is, isn't it? I mean, nature wants to go back to the normal, whatever it was. And so, yes, we have to come up with a better plan that makes it more sustainable, better able to uh, resist. Fight nature? Yeah. yeah. We're going to try to work with nature, right? Yes. Because wow. <laughs> right? yeah. we have to. Um, yeah. And then one of the, you mentioned it the, uh, the first time around, the watershed for Brookline is tremendous, right? We have neighborhoods of water coming into the site. And I think, um, to me, capturing some of that before it gets onto the golf course and taking some of the highs from the flooding so that the water could sit, control, and not get on the fairways and not get into the soil so quickly, uh, hopefully will help with the ditch maintenance and, and uh, you know drainage and being able to, to just make it more sustainable. Yeah, I mean, when the course was built, there wasn't the development around it, you know? And now with all the, the more roads, more drainage coming off the roads, more houses around it, it takes a lot more water than it used to. And uh, that contributes to the issue that we have here today. Plus the fact that, as Tim said, the watershed is big. I mean, all, all the water from the country club comes into your course, the hillside across the, the roads come across. I mean, it's big, wa big watershed coming into this area. And it's a big sponge. It's about a square mile around the property that, that uh, all comes through this system of canals and ditches and there's only one exit point on the whole piece of property so over there over Correct. there on the you, in cleaning it before it gets onto the property do you mean underground storage open pond what what would yeah i mean i think it's it's everything's on the table but i would imagine that there would be some kind of a four bay wetland pond storage area um, some of it may be even rough that floods in an event, but not fairway or playing areas. And you have space to be able to do that here? Uh, we're looking at that. You know, is there is there enough space? I don't know. I don't think we've we've you know looked at how big and how much water and you know et cetera. But there's definitely areas that where I see pipes coming in that we can work with looking at golf features and, and creating something interesting, which also creates habitat and, and other values as well. So. so we're on the current first tee of the golf course, so players have to start from the clubhouse and work around the practice range to get to this point before they start their round of golf. Um, this tee has two separate tees, uh, a little bit small for the first tee of a golf course. Usually you make the first tee area bigger so that, you know, people can practice swing on it and they're, they're a lot of times waiting around to tee off. Uh, and um, so this tee is on the small side and I would want this tee to be bigger. 
Um, there's also not a big separation between the different T markers. So usually this, t this course has three T markers, correct? A back, a middle, and a front. And there's just, there's not a lot of separation here between the markers. And that's something that we see throughout this golf course is that there needs to be more separation. There needs to be more forward tees added to the course so that it's a shorter course for the slower swing speed players. Um, on the right hand side of the hole over here, there's been started some nice vegetation management. There's places on the course that have become overgrown with invasive plants and, uh, and, and new growth. It slows down play. It uh, can be unsightly. And so Mike has started to remove some of that invasive vegetation and we're gonna be like working in some more grass into these areas. It won't be maintained grass. It won't need to be watered or anything like that, but it'll be more manageable and I, it will look a lot better. So uh, that's, a, that's a, a big part of the, of the master plan is to improve playability, improve speed of play, and improve aesthetics of the course. And what we have here is, is uh, you know, kind of classic in terms of classic styles design where we have the tees and the green next to us on the high points of the property and the fairways in the valleys. I mean, that's how Ross designed his courses, Styles designed his. It's just the best way to make use of the topography. So great use of the topography throughout this whole course, uh, the, way the, the way the holes play across the land. This also shows us the challenges of this site with the amount of ledge rock that they had to avoid um, or build upon, and then the valleys being peat and not such good soil. So one other thing about this hole is that, as we talked about, uh, because of the length of the golf hole and the need to try to, and to make it a safe golf hole and to, you know, keep play, play flowing on the course, they, you go with 12 minutes between tee times on the course. Okay, the typical course is eight to 10 minutes. So you're basically, you're losing about a foursome an hour as you play the golf course, which is, which is a big revenue loss. So there's things that you might be able to do to this hole to improve it, to be able to um, uh, shorten up that space between tee times. Or, you know, like I said, we might look at maybe changing the routing so that this isn't the first hole anymore. But that would be what we feel would be, it would be done for safety and for revenue. You mentioned the uh, tee boxes. I did. Uh, would you consider adding more tee boxes? In, there uh, will definitely be more tee boxes. For, yes. A de a yes. Different grades of, uh, of players? Absolutely, yep. Yep. Um, there'll be more tee boxes and probably another set of markers. Yeah. This is a hard first hole because a lot of balls go in the woods and that well, starts, starts we your day hear off. two things. I mean, we hear that it's, uh, there's balls going left into the woods and into the stream and right into the second fairway. So yeah, from an elevated tee, you get more spray. That's the only negative about an elevated tee is you get a lot more Dispersion. Dispersion, <laughs> excellent. Good word for that. Wait, what was? Forward is the future, right? Forward is the future, yes. That was the slogan we... we but we, yeah, I mean, golf, the trend in golf today is, is uh, to move players forward, to make the game more fun. And uh, so, as I said on the last tour, forward is the future for, for us here. Walking down the hill, and we were thinking about um, the golf course being accessible to, to all people, and how the how wide the the paths are, etc. Do you um, do you and anticipate steep. and steep? Do you anticipate addressing any of that in the master plan? Yes, yes, we we do. Um, golf is unique in terms of accessibility in that uh, we try to go by. The rule of thumb that we want to make one tee accessible by cart, 
the fairway accessible by cart and obviously the green be accessible by cart or or uh, and so it's sometimes not possible to make every tee in every bunker accessible but if we can achieve that goal that's that's what's basically our requirement um, and so in making some and looking at the course and and recommending some of these changes that's definitely something that we will include as part of our review uh, when we get up to the third tee it was one it was a point that I made on our last walk walk through that doesn't occur that maybe we can improve upon uh, as part of the plan. So yeah, absolutely. We have one more question. I'm not sure if the question was directed in this way, but what about sharing the golf course with non-golfers? Pedestrian access. Is the question was about uh, sharing the golf course with pedestrian access. Sharing the golf course with pedestrians is always a huge safety issue because golfers don't know where their golf ball is going and it can go almost anywhere. So it's quite hard to have pedestrians out walking around on a golf course while golf is in play. Obviously, when you get to this time of year, golf courses become available to ed everybody. But when it's during time of play, during the season, it's a real challenge and um, quite honestly a real safety issue to have them wandering around. And are walkers prohibited during the season? During when golf is going on, but uh, on Monday mornings, we don't allow golf to take place before noon. Yeah. So we really have that opportunity for residents to come out, walk the dogs, get some you know, active recreation uh, going on out here. And it's a great place to come for a walk and stop and have lunch afterwards. And I just want to mention too for the group here that we are looking as part of the master plan for other recreational opportunities after we get to the major priorities, obviously, um, that, that Mark's already shared. Perhaps, yes, uh, we typically, as part of our master plan process, look to try to create a trail system in the golf course within, if there is space to do so. You know, where, where golf courses are, you know, don't have that space, then, it, and then it's not necessarily possible other than, again, when golf is not in play. But I mean, it's something that we will look towards trying to achieve. Absolutely. Is that cross skiing, perhaps? <laughs> yes. Okay, sledding. The, the question was, does that include golf uh, or cross country skiing, sledding, snowshoeing, all of that? Yes, dog walking. So when you asked if the course is accessible, it is many, many months out of the year, right? So we just want to make sure that we think of that and include those ideas in our master plan. I, I do want to <clears throat> stress that I, you know, we've always talked about people walking through here, and I remember one when you had the select board here and a couple of commissioners, and I, and we started walking around, uh, cutting cutting across a tee or whatever, and they was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, and so people who don't golf are unaware of what's going on, and you can really get hit hard with the ball, and I think that that's the issue. I mean, you can, you can get really, really hurt by a golf ball flying at full speed. And it doesn't seem obvious to everybody, but to me that day it did. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We'll I stopped here because I wanted just to point out a few things. Um, we talked about drainage and the pipe going under the range and the stream. So the stream runs along the left side of this hole and it exits the property. Uh, at the road down here to the left of the first green and that is the lowest point on the property and so that's really our point that defines our, our drainage but you know because of that pipe you know it's that's really defines the drainage for the most of the property this is just this corner uh, we're standing on an area that uh, the, we cannot excavate um, it's AUL soils or something. It's it's basically uh, there was um, some waste material from the industrial age that was buried here or placed here, and so uh, we can't cut into this area where we're standing. And there's a few of these areas within within the golf course. So not anything to be concerned about, but just uh, you know, in terms of our design, we have to take that into account. And then thirdly, just the green that we're looking at is the first green, a really original styles green. It's got great character, great contours. Uh, there's some areas of that green that 
Um, we're proposing to be restored where we make the green a little bit bigger than what it is now. It's just, it's just become more rounded and grown in on the edges. Um, and so it's just moving those mowing lines a little bit further out and making it a little bit bigger. The bunkers, you know, they, they are in need of, uh, of a restoration, renovation process to, you know, improve the edges, uh, improve the drainage and then get better sand that's, uh, that's not uh, compromised by stones and, and that. So that would be, again, an, another process that should take place throughout the golf course is, is a review of the bunkers and renovation of the bunkers and bringing them up to uh, a better, you know, better standards. This, if you can't touch it. It's not that you can't touch it, you just can't cut it. So we can add soil to it and plant it. Oh, okay. oh. So that's what we would probably do. It is part of uh, the wonderful framing of the Stiles Green. It's looking at the invasive species on the left, the vines in the vegetation and cleaning that out and screening maybe the road behind it, trying to provide some kind of visual separation, maybe even some noise separation between the green and, uh, and uh, I forget the name of the street, but yes. So we talked about how a golf course is a living organism and it changes over time. And I just wanted to point out how, um, Things get removed and things get added. You know, the cart paths are an added feature that weren't part of the original design. Bunkers, used to be a bunker, a sand bunker here, that got removed at some point. There was a sand bunker to the left between the cart path and the uh, fence that is no longer there. And there was a bunker on the right-hand side of the hole as you started up the hill that was, that's shown on the 1938 plan. And so, you know, the, the course has, has changed and will continue to change. Um, and our goal is to, to look at what was here previously and look to see which things should be restored. You know, uh, like I said on the, about the greens and how we should restore them back out to their original size. Maybe some of these bunkers should be put back into play. Um, we want to add character to the golf course, basically, and, and bring that character back. Another thing here that, uh, whoops, almost, is, you know, when we come look at this golf hole, one of the first negative thoughts we had is the fence on the right-hand side. It just, you know, it's just from an aesthetic standpoint, it's so out of character and, and, and ugly. And um, so, but it's but it provides a safety you know it provides some safety a safety factor there uh, but what is there something else that we could do that we could eliminate the fence uh, that's something we want to look at because it would it would it really spoils the look of this golf hole so goes a long way toward really helping the golf course because these i think are probably the most ugly two holes in the golf course yeah could be that comment I just want to hear it <laughs> what was that uh, these first holes are the most ugly yeah and you know when you improve those I think visitor and enjoyment would increase certainly thank I'm you good. although the fence does keep up the rate of play yes uh, right. a comment from the last tour was you know someone said well my ball bounces back off the fence and keeps it in play as you said that's not fair though <laughs> right <laughs> we need it. Mike's been doing a lot of work to try to extend these greens and collars back out to what their original size was already. But, uh, you know, in, in our process, we're going to probably be pointing out a few more. Uh, case in point is the left side, or the side we're standing on of, of this green here, where it probably used to extend a little bit further out um, and, and would like to see that restored back out to the original size, out into this corner a little bit and along this side and at the front left corner. Um, but here also we're looking at um, access and how to improve upon access and to be able to maybe get rid of some of these stairs and steps and uh, worn areas from traffic 
to be and and get improved access for everybody into these green settings and T settings. So here we've got a path that's a little bit too close on the front left. Be better if this path was a little bit further away, if we could extend the slopes and get a little bit more gradual a slope. Maybe this bunker disappears in doing that. We have a grass bunker on this side. Uh, it's not seen from down below where you're hitting your shot up to the green typically. And it just restricts access to the green. We've got this rock, gravel, wood tie walkway. I think it would be great to shift this path further to the left so that we could soften the slope down to the path and create better access up into the green and more accessible access up into the green. And the same applies to the tees where we have steps going up into the back tee, then no steps up to the middle tee. And so, you know, the, the back tee is somewhat accessible from the path, but the middle tee is not accessible at all. And that path maybe should be raised shifted closer to the T, and again, the slope softened up into that T. Um, this is kind of a, if you're familiar with George Wright Golf Course in Boston, uh, it's another project I consult at, and that's a big part of what we're doing over there is to make T's bigger, to make them more accessible, uh, and to uh, kind of clean up around them and make it so that we don't end up with these, uh, uh, with all the traffic in one spot and uh, spread out wear a little bit better. And I can tell you, I, I personally have slipped and fallen and I've had a dead spot, and my knee blew for a problem. Yeah. Really? Yeah. But what a great spot, huh? I mean, up here on the hill. I do want to point out, uh, everybody out here is an outdoor enthusiast, I am sure, in some capacity, whether you play golf or not. But most of us up here do not have a, a real appreciation for the power of lightning. I want to show you Mother Nature's version of art. Wow. That is the direct result of a lightning strike. And uh, that will remain uh, for those to uh, really appreciate the sheer power of lightning. But that was a, one of these massive uh, trees uh, that is no longer massive. It was blown apart into... Where did that happen? That happened in September, maybe? Late September, wow. somewhere around there? That's a good reminder. It was amazing. Does it have a flag? It, will, it could have a flag. <laughs> <laughs> Lightning bolt 2021. And that core, <laughs> that tree is like smooth as a baby's. It's really, it's impressive. It's, uh, it's not something you see every day. So that was a, a uh, heck of a strike and just Another reminder to be careful with lightning. So this hole, we we think presents a bit too much of a challenge to uh, the average and lesser player because of the separation between the end of the fairway and the green itself. You know, it's a what we call a forced carry from of uh, might be a hundred yards. Uh, and with the two bunkers, I mean, you get players hitting into this bunker, then hitting into that bunker, then hitting on the green. The hole used, didn't used to look like this. The hole used to have bunkers along this right-hand side here, up against this ridge, and I think it was fairway running up the left-hand side and into the green. Now, I love the look of the hole from the tee. I love, you know, I like how it looks, but I'm not so sure we want to have two bunkers the way, that, the way it's designed right now. You know, maybe we can get by with eliminating one and then still having the other, but it's something that we want to look at is to uh, make this a little bit easier, a hole coming up into the green. On this hole here, it's a long creek and there's just one bridge. If you have the ball in the other fairway, it's a real pain and the same thing coming back. Sure. We need two bridges. Yeah, <laughs> we need three. Yeah, yeah. but yes, more yes, yeah. yes, more bridges is, is definitely a part of our plan. Absolutely, and that could be coming soon. This fairway. Master plan. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, this fairway also presents real issues with drainage. It's probably this one and number and number nine are the biggest uh, issues in regards to being wet, and therefore. Um, uh, 
impacting use of the golf course. So these are the two that we really want to pay particular attention to trying to get better drainage in this area. You can see there's like a ridge down the middle of the fairway and uh, I think that used to be like a rock drain where they placed rocks so that the water could run between the rocks and run out but uh, it's filled in with sediments now and is no longer working and um, needs really to be improved upon. So. If you continue to do that Justin that's part of maintenance also budgeting. What's that? To clean, to clean out those so that'll probably be a part of a, of, a, of a phase and, you know, replacing that, you know, historical French drain system, you know, with an actual drainage pipe and, and some modern technology built in, you know, and that's really kind of, I would say, part of a, a, a construction phase more so than a maintenance phase. So this whole, I uh, just wanted to stop here briefly just to mention about, again, the, the tees and the need for additional tees. Uh, the carry from the forwardmost tee right now is a long ways to the start of the fairway. And it's not only a long ways, but the area between the front of the tee and the, and the start of the fairway is so wet that, you know, you can lose a ball if you hit it in the middle of the hole and it goes in the mud. So. This is one in particular that we would want to add tees in the location that we're standing now and then even further forward to shorten the, the, the carry to the start of the fairway. So I just wanted to stop here to talk a little bit about uh, the US Open, which is going to be next door in June. and. Uh, what that means for, for you guys here on, on Brookline Golf Course. The, the US Open has made arrangements with the course to park cars here and also have media here and security on this site. And car parking is gonna occur on this fairway, six, three, I mean four. I always get that wrong. <laughs> That's all right. We're getting there. 10, 10 8, and 11 and they will have an entrance into the course right here at this gate in front of six green how do so, they get over there they will use the cart paths to to drive on and uh i think cars are coming in at the main entrance yeah, yeah cars are coming in at the main entrance we have a whole traffic plan in, in on the property and they'll all exit out on hammond street by the second tee box so uh, quite the network of uh, cart paths being utilized and also temporary uh, roadway matting that's uh, that'll be laid down to, to kind of protect the golf course but uh, we're, we're we are excited about you know helping them and and, and having a, a hand in, in uh, hosting the US Open and also um, rest assured that uh, the golf course is going to be restored to as conditions, if not better conditions. So um, with that protection and, and that stuff in the agreement with the town, um, come on down. My house is your house. So uh, we're, we're gonna welcome them with open arms and do everything we can to showcase Brookline and, and our best uh, ability to do that. How long do you think it'll take them to restore after the uh, Can you repeat the question, please? So the, the question was, how long is it going to take to restore? So that's a question that we can't answer because we don't know the level of damage that is going to be done. Uh, we are expecting um, several weeks, potentially, um, that will, will be affected, but we really don't know the extent of the damage mm -hmm. today to, to definitely say, we're going to be we're going to, it's going to be a two week restoration or is it going to be a, a month restoration we really don't know the biggest thing is that we know is it's it's going to be restored and that's the most reassuring thing that we have to work with so justin i know we went through the same thing at lars anderson also and uh 
there were many, many questions of who does the assessment beforehand, the documentation, and who's yep. going to assess it afterwards, and who puts the price on it, and hopefully you're protecting yourself. Absolutely. In, in so in that way. So you know? the question was, you know, how, who does the assessment beforehand to kind of determine the level of restoration? It's something that we will do uh, with the USGA to document the areas before they're utilized. Uh, and then as part of the agreement, we deem, we have the ability to deem what's important and what's not important. It's not up for them to determine what's important. So that's really important in terms of, you know, how things are restored. But again, you know, to the point I made earlier, we don't know w how much restoration is going to be needed or how extensive that process will look like until unfortunately the damage is done, you know, and, and like, Mark has mentioned before in the previous tour, we really look at this as, yes, it's an inconvenience, but it's more or less an opportunity. You know, we walked through some areas already on the golf course that are kind of maybe opportunities for substantial improvement with just a little bit of love and TLC and, and uh, you know, maybe a, a piece of heavy equipment or two, yeah. you know, so it's, uh, we're excited about this and, and not necessarily dreading this. Will they compensate you for lost revenue? Yes. So we are we are well protected here at the golf course, which is great. Will the range close too? So the range will open as long as possible, but beginning on June 9th, everything at the golf course will cease operations and be fully handed over to the USGA. So we we intend to keep the range open all the way up until you know the end of day June 8th, uh, and then it will be reopening right around June 23rd, I believe is the date, uh, for the range. Uh, the golf course, you know, again, as we're talking about restoration, uh, part of the process is they're only using, you know, nine holes on the golf course, eight holes. So there could be an opportunity to really create a, a shorter golf course, you know, an eight hole or a nine hole golf course to get folks back out here recreating. Mm -hmm. As opposed to letting it rest until it's all back to... The exactly, yeah. exactly. We feel it's a, it's a, it's it's our responsibility to get it back open to the residents as soon as possible. I was involved in the U.S. Open at uh, Olympia Fields in Chicago in 2003, and uh, you know, it's hosting the Open is a huge operation. I mean, the amount of people that it takes, and the equipment, and the TV trucks when they roll in. I mean, it's a big operation. It used to be that they used to have to gravel roads to get out into the golf course. Nowadays, they use these grids that they put down on top of the grass. You see them at Fenway Park when they have concerts and they just grid over the grass. They pick it up and they're done. So, I mean, there's, they're a lot less invasive now than it used to be in the past uh, when they host something like this. So, I, I have no qualms about the fact that it's going to be, you know, in good shape soon after their event. Uh, you know, so it beats yeah. the alternative. So they started going to this matting system probably about three years ago. Oh. Uh, they started going to this system about three years ago, but before that, to Mark's point, it used to be about 18 inches of crushed aggregate, and that essentially is a death sentence. And I think that's what's been done here in the past right. for the 88 Open and the, and the 99 Ryder Cup. So, you know, going to this matting system really you know, significantly mitigates the, the damage risk uh, that's been done in the past. So um, it's, uh, but we, as, as uh, everybody knows, this will be probably the first U.S. Open post pandemic. Uh, so really the last two U.S. Opens have really been, you know, uh, substantially reduced in scale and scope because of the pandemic. So we're really kind of looking on the other side of the uh, pandemic for getting back to a what is a new normal U.S. Open. So we're excited to, to be a part of that. So we stopped here just to talk a little bit again about the drainage of the course. You can see that the fairways are flat and they've got all these pockets which hold water probably underlain by peat for the most part, though maybe not every area of fairway is underlain by peat. And then we've got this ridge, which is the uh, drainage culvert running across the fairway on a diagonal angle. And we're going we're gonna to look at some of these areas and see, you know, there are some ditches that we feel we might want to pipe. 
but some piped areas that we would prefer to turn back into an open ditch. This would be one that we might want to turn this one back into an open ditch to better get the water through here. When you, when you have an open ditch, it typically dries out the area around it better than having an enclosed pipe, which doesn't allow water to come into that area laterally, and a lot of times blocks the flow of water. And what you're seeing here too, is that over time, these concrete pipes have, have been pushed up. The freezing and thawing of the ground um, actually pushes up the heavier material to the, to the surface, so you get these raised areas. Uh, on three, it was the rock, the rock lined um, uh, ditch that we saw was on four. <laughs> Thank you. On four. Like three. It was the, yeah. It was the French drain, the rock French drain. And here it's the pipe. It's gotten pushed up. And so, you know, we're looking at maybe taking some of these and making them into ditches. Just a question about the uh, ditches and, and the, you know, small canals is that uh, in a, you, you, just looking at a lot of different areas that, that it looks like canals could provide a way, great way of draining you know the fairways and so on and so forth and that uh, and that you know these the, the ditches or the small little rivers whatever you want to call them you know also you know probably could be really useful in a lot of cases and I'm just wondering at what point is there a trade-off of you're creating too many obstacles for the game of golf exactly yeah yes yes it's how they're located that is the key you know and trying to put them into areas that you know do not slow down the game too much you know whether it be you know just in front of the tee is a best is a better location than 150 yards from the tee uh, it's very it's critical to the design that they be in the places that impact the design either minimally or in areas that they become strategic. This also seems like this is a huge opportunity to have a landscape, working landscape element that could also really be, you know, a, a uh, interesting aesthetic contribution and, and a real theme throughout the uh, entire course. So it uh, just seems like a really interesting opportunity. It is, you're right. I mean, it's, uh, that is something that we are actually very interested in looking at trying to do and working with the local conservation commission to get, a, to get approved is to, the ability to, you know, help us to move the water, but create habitat, create uh, an aesthetic and a character to, the, to this golf course with those features. One, one, one little thing to tie in the history, when you go back inside, look at the 1938 aerial and you'll see how many of these ditches are actually daylighted. But back in the day in 1933, when the golf course opened, golf was a different game. You know, the golf ball didn't go up in the air. It ran along the ground much more prevalently. So as, as people played the golf course over the first 15, 20 years, Murph, you know, they found the golf course to play very, very difficult because of the numerous ditches. So they went to extraordinary lengths and and putting down these corrugated steel tubes that exist today uh, to make the game more enjoyable. But the game has evolved and, and players now can get the golf ball to go up in the air and therefore land at a much more steeper angle, making, the, making this piece of property more enjoyable while providing the opportunity to re-daylight some of these these creeks and make it more functional again so it's 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 how you know history has changed and the game has changed and evolved and uh, we might be able to go back in time with our landscape features and and get back to some better functionality on the golf course so they, they weren't really electrical uh, things back in culverts i mean th some of the open trenches like on 13 which is in exactly the wrong place. I mean, the, the, it is exactly the, 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 the wetland. Yeah, the wetlands people won't let you cover that up, will they? So that's all part of the conversations right. that we're going to have, and we, you know, we look forward to collaborating. This is what you are collaborating with you. We're going to collaborate with them and and our team of professionals, and and uh, just understand that it's you know we're going to we're going to gain some ground and we're going to lose some ground. It's just part of the process, you know, to get to a a, a mutually compromised. Uh, golf course. Right. Yeah, we always hope that 
or we, we plan that there will be a net benefit to the environment and therefore that they will look at this as a benefit and if we have to pipe an area, oh, that's a negative, but this benefit overrides the negative. And that's why, you know, that's why this plan is going to take some time because of the complexity of that, right? You know what I mean? We really, we really need to, we, we really need to design the entire system so that we truly understand that, that net result. Just wanted to uh, make note of this very unique green. Um, there was a green that Alistair McKenzie, or two of them actually, designed in England at a course called Sitwell Park. And I believe that this green is emulating those two greens. At Sitwell Park, there's a, it was built into a steep slope. And instead of just cutting the back down and raising the front to make it a more level surface, Mackenzie put all these terraces in with little pockets at all different levels. And it's a really big green. And there might be 15 feet of elevation change between the front of the green and the back of the green. And I think, I think Stiles got wind of what was being done at Sitwell Park or, or saw pictures of it because it was a pretty, it was uh, publicized and uh, built something similar here where we've got, you know, we've got all these different levels and it really works high up onto the hill. And, you know, it, depending on if the pin is at the front or the back, it, it's a several club difference in terms of the shot into the green. So I think this is a great, has great character and I think it needs to be restored further to the back. I think there's actually a back level that's, that's, that's now missing from the green, but um, I think it's pretty neat. Is there a way to, I don't want to make it flatter without, without losing its, because what ends up happening is it ends up back here and then you're back up again. Yep. Sure, she asked if there was a way to change the surface of the green so that it's a little bit flatter at the front primarily so the ball doesn't just run off the front. Is it right here or right there? And, and <laughs> yes, there is, there is ways to um, subtly change the green. You have to lift the grass up, add some soil, uh, maybe cut a little bit and then put that grass back down. And you can, you can, you can modify it a little bit. Uh, if you want to modify it a lot, it takes a re reconstruction. And by that, I know that's not what you're saying. And that's not what that I wouldn't be interested in doing that. I'd want to just subtly modify it. We did that at two, uh, one of my previous golf courses I worked at. We had a very similar situation where there was only one pinnable location on the green, and they hired a golf course architect come in. They lasered it. They removed the the grass, and they changed the pitch by about three to five percent. Put the grass back, and within two or three months, you never knew that they did anything but all of a sudden you were able to putt and have much different pin locations, but to the naked eye, you really couldn't tell. So it's amazing what they can do with modern technology now. Yeah, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Gannon Golf Course, but that's a Styles course in Lynn, Mass. And uh, the fourth green had a front section that was too steep to cup. And uh, two years ago, we reworked that green and now the front half of that green is cuppable. So it's, it's certainly able to be done. Uh, just another note around this area, we're getting into a very unique part of the golf course where we're heading into the trees. Uh, in the history, it was said that the uh, town of Brookline had two requirements that it asked of the golf course architect, and one was that it not, he not design golf holes where the slice side of the golf hole or the right side of the golf hole was out of bounds, so the balls wouldn't go out into, would be less likely to be hit into the streets or adjacent properties and that the hemlock grove that we find behind us be saved as much as possible. So that's why we still have the hemlock trees behind us that, that you see, and it's such a unique part of the, of, of, the, of the golf course, and styles true to what they requested did not route any golf holes with out-of-bounds on the right-hand side.
signature hole here at Brookline is this par three with the, you know, the downhill nature of the golf hole, the ledge behind the green, the trees that surround us here at the tee. Um, just a, a, a wonderful golf hole. And even the green itself, I love the green, how it slopes to the back right. It's not just coming towards us like a lot of, a lot of old greens were sloped just back to front. And this one has a, the, the left to right slope on it. You know, we can see here where the tee is very unlevel. Again, this left-hand side can't even be used. Um, so that would be something that we'd wanna improve upon. Uh, bunkering here has been changed. Uh, Mike sent me a picture just the other day which showed the bunker extending further across the front of the green. Um, I don't like that. I like it better the way it is now with the two bunkers on the right and having an opening into the green on the left hand side. But these, the bunkering on these, this green here is changed as well where, you know, it's uh, again evolved over time. perfect segue to vegetation yeah. right so so you know the road is there and of course you can see it because there's no leaves on there now but one of the things that I'm really going to be looking at is the vegetation and I love the hemlocks and, and the idea that you still have them and I know there's been some maintenance over time uh, maybe we're going to revisit and keeping that because we'd, we'd hate to lose them we also want to look at the trees overall on the entire golf course edges maintaining edges and borders and kind of at least a visual separation uh, but also within the whole corridors, between the holes, you know, lines of trees aren't aesthetically pleasing. Maybe there's the quality of the tree, you know, the long-term oaks and pines that have the character of what you see around in the landscape versus some of the others. Maybe the, uh, there's been some ash planted and, and Norway maples and invasive species trees planted. So, uh, you know, going through and reviewing that, where do we want to keep trees for safety reasons and aesthetic reasons, uh, you know, for noise reasons. So really trying to get a grasp on that. Maybe even planting more hemlocks, if we can find them. I didn't even know you could get them anymore. Aren't trees self In some capacity they do. That's one of their things that they do. They do, and I usually, this is where Mike pipes in, where it's like that's where they start competing with actually the turf roots. And so they, they might be helpful, but they're also harmful to uh, fine turf. And so you, you, know, you run that edge. Like we walk by where you have a wonderful beech tree back left of 12. And it, it's a tree that I'd like to highlight, uh, but then it's gonna require maintenance. So we need to root prune that on a consistent basis so that you can have a, a, a good quality, healthy turf on the green. So. It's always gonna be balance, right? Yeah. I'm thinking more along the fairways suck up all that excess water. Yeah, I mean, I think they help, but it's not as much as just good drainage will. No. talking about looking at the trees and noticing that there's some green mossy and and uh, there's there's one tree that's kind of has darker bark in nature and she's wondering uh, is part of our plan to look at these trees and understand what's causing that um, and I think it's really it, it's a it's a situation of you know the golf course poorly draining over the years and are these species the right species in these environments and you know I'll leave it up to the experts. I'm not an arborist, I'm just a golf pro. But I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. I liked those commercials back in the day. But, um, you know, I think it's an environmental. It's, it's looking at the situationally uh, and, and seeing it. Is this tree in the right environment to, to thrive? You know? Does the town arborist have to approve? Yeah, so we work hand in hand with Tom Brady. He's fantastic. Um, you know, we got to pull them up from Tampa every now and then to, to get them up that. there. You knew that was going there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, Tom is, is a friend of the golf course and, 
and really supportive uh, in our selective tree removal program. And we're really kind of working on, you know, trees that are diseased and not healthy at the moment and trying to mitigate any risks to, you know, golfers and, and tree fails, you know. I, I just think the golf course needs a lot of those signature trees and it's a great opportunity to look at that and bring it in your master plan, get support from the community, um, go golfers and having a plan that actually helps save and produce that character, you know, from, from your golf to your golf course. Yeah, no, I, and I agree. Wayne Styles loved to do groupings of plants, whether it was, uh, whether it was pines or hemlocks or, or oaks, like over here behind nine. Um, so emulating that, I think, is a good concept going forward. Not individual trees, per se, maybe one or two here or there, but maybe more groupings. Um, I think it fits with the scale of the landscape better. Are there anything that's ever did, been done with a golf course with... Uh, donations for like memorial trees and things like that or is that I, I don't know that his that history of it I'm not sure on that I really don't but it's something that you know maybe if if there is a planting uh, plan right that is conceived you know that may be something that we go down that avenue I mean previous golf courses I've worked at we've done that with hardscapes right people buy memorial bricks and we fund a patio that way so um, it's it's all you know. It's all. I think everything's on the table. There's nothing that's off the table. I know we so do that with our parks, right? Sure. Yeah. So. Sure. We just want to be able to you know uh, understand the the scale and, and scope of how many and and you know we're putting some uh, programs in the way. But I want to get back to these gentlemen and let them finish up here. I mean, from a master plan perspective, it's our goal that there be variety in the golf course, and that would be variety in the landscape, variety in the trees, variety so that if there's anything catastrophic that occurs with the trees, that it doesn't affect you, right? I mean, over the past years, we've lost elms to disease. Uh, ash trees are now, the emerald ash borer is killing all the trees. So we've got to be careful that there's variety. In, in the tree plantings that we utilize. Yeah. Um, talk about circulation? Yep. So this whole 13 we have, for us, from a golf play standpoint, a bit of an issue in that we have two ditches that cross the hole perpendicularly, and then also we have the steep slope up into the green. So it presents three different problems in terms of hitting from the tee up to the green. Uh, the first ditch that crosses right about where the dog is running right now is most most impactful on, on tee shots and on the play of the golf hole. And that's one that I think from our side of it, we would love to see disappear. We'd like to see fairway continue through that area. The other one is fine. It's beyond the drive zone of most players. And uh, of course, we're not, we can't do anything about the slope going up into the green. This is one of my favorite greens on the golf course. Uh, I think it's a great putting surface. Uh, long term, uh, I talked on the first hole about, you know, about the routing of the golf course and the distance from the clubhouse to the first tee. And we're looking at potentially making this hole the first hole so that it has better proximity to the clubhouse and the pro shop has visibility of the tee so they can better control what, you know, when people are leaving and, and teeing off and playing the golf hole. It's a longer golf hole. Uh, it's a faster hole to play if the ditch is eliminated, the first <laughs> ditch is eliminated. And, you know, there are issues obviously about, you know, holes on either side and the stray shots, but I think this would Know, might work out as as a better first first hole. We looked at a, adding even a tee back here for the longer hitter. So and adding forward tees, of course. Okay. Fifteen also has two ditches going across. It does. What, could you eliminate one of those two? <laughs> we will look into it. That's okay. for sure. <laughs> So 
we've reached the 18th green and uh, what Mike has done with uh, extending out the collar and creating the, the low cut fairway area to the left of this green is, is something that will play a big part in the rest of the master plan and, and will be done at other holes as well. I, I think this is a great, a great thing that he's done. It creates interest in terms of the play around the greens and as to whether you chip or whether you putt. Um, you know, it shows that you don't need bunkers to add challenge and interest in how, how, how you hit the ball around the green. So I uh, just wanted to kind of point this out. This green too, we, there's some restoration work that can be done on the back right, the back left onto the mound, um, making it a little bit bigger and bringing some of those contours into the putting surface and not just on the, uh, in the roughs at the outside or in the collars. So. Uh, this is a, a good finishing hole. We're really, I think this really works appropriately as the 18th hole. So, um, I'm not a golfer, so don't kill me if I say the wrong thing, <laughs> please. But knowing that there are dreams for the clubhouse, mm -hmm. and if you look at that, uh, expanding the terrace, having a larger terrace down below and pulling that wall this way, what does that do to this hole? Is that something that could be do done to be give that the clubhouse more space for yeah, functions, you know, like a 100, 250 people wedding there, for example, you know, having the space outside? Um, yeah, I think, that, you know, like, like everything, there's going to be a collaboration, right? And, you know, we've got uh, Mark and his team, and we're going to hire a clubhouse architect that, you know, we'll probably look at what we can do with the with the clubhouse itself, uh, and then the two of them can work together on those shared ideas. And you know, it, it, is it a matter of lowering that grate up there to create a two-floor system up there, or bring it out? You know, there's all sorts of different uh, ideas, and and possibilities are endless. But I think at the end of the day, we got to get back to really being a collaboration, you know, and working together because. You know, this, as Mark said, this is a great 18th hole, you know, and if we bring out people too far, too close, we're introducing some safety issues, right? And so there, there's there's always going to be a balance, but I think at the end of the day, we got to get to collaboration and, and, and understanding um, how they're going to fit together. And it's really going to be the work of, of his team and, and the clubhouse team to do that. We have some certain safety setbacks, which we recommend. Rec we recommend them. I mean, they're not always adhered to. And, uh, and two, you also have to look at elevation. So when we do a safety setback on a plan, it's two dimensional. We're just measuring, you know, 100 feet from the back of a green, say. But here we have some elevation. So maybe that reduces the setback a little bit because of the elevation difference. But I, we would want to see any plan that any architect comes up with for the for the clubhouse and make comment on it as to whether we feel it's it's safe or not. So recreate like just in I know this is gonna be something you do, but if you were to move the green here, what does that do with your distance? Does that really compromise your game? It's, uh, no, if it's a matter of feet it doesn't compromise. Uh, this this is a very long par four. Yes. So bringing the green in I don't think is gonna compromise the hole that much unless you're a huge hitter. Anyway, something to look at, just because of that. I, and I know that you're going to do it with your other architects, but that's always something that I've seen, how close this is now, even now, you know, and, and the feeling of being protected or being able to come down to the terrace without falling down in the green. I'm talking more as an architect, so <laughs> yeah, not as yeah. a golfer. Well, it needs to blend together. You know, it's got to work on both ways. So maybe that's the best place to have outdoor seating for the number that you need to, and maybe the green does need to move, or maybe there's another location for outdoor seating. Exactly, it's not there. You know, and it, and it becomes a cost discussion because the patio over there is half the cost of moving the green. You know, so exactly. right. right. Value engineering. <laughs> value architecture. Yes. Value architecture. Yes. We don't. We don't keep engineers. <laughs> so, any thought about the practice area over here and how that could be changed or made bigger or you know? 
improved upon? Yeah, I definitely think there's, you know, I, I think, you know, Mark and his team are going to look at everything, you know, okay. and, uh, okay. you know, it's it's a nice putting green. There's a lot of people that come to our golf course to, right. to putt on the green, but, you know, I think everything is, is, is up for consideration and, and, uh, and it's going to be looked at um, for improvement. It's a, it's a, it's a master plan. It's, it's really going to take us well into the future, but I want to kind of turn it over to Mark and do um, you have anything you want to close out with? Um, yeah, in terms of practice, just to respond to what you said is uh, um, a lot of uh, courses these days are adding short game practice areas to their um, you know, amenities. So uh, that would be something we would look to try to see if we could find for here as well. And then in terms of the master plan, this master plan process, as I said, is a, probably a year long process. Uh, we want to get your input into it. Uh, Tim and I, I mean, we're leading the process, but we want to collaborate with everybody from the town on what's best for this uh, facility. So we want to get your thoughts and ideas. Uh, we, we've talked about uh, having a survey or creating a survey. And so when that comes out, if you could get your responses, that would be awesome. Um, and uh, this has been a great turnout. It's great to see you all. Thank you very much. And look forward to working with you. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. And to echo Mark's comments, you know, this is really day one of a long road. You know, and, and it's not going to be a road that's going to be traveled by one car. It's an it's information superhighway. So as we said in the beginning, this is going to be a collaboration. Uh, stay tuned to our uh, website uh, at the golf course. There's a little heading under the community. Uh, and then underneath that, there'll be a master plan section. So uh, there will just going to be more uh, opportunities to provide feedback. So we appreciate it if you share this experience with your friends. Uh, get involved. This is our golf course. It's not my course. It's not his course, but it's Correct. really It could be a crown jewel of the whole entire town and the surrounding community So we appreciate you coming out here today and uh, thank you for getting involved and uh, Stay with us because the best is yet to come Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Thanks, thanks.